Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Is there any way to end the war in Ukraine? Let's get to the bottom line. Exactly one year ago, all-out war broke out between Russia and Ukraine at the cost of hundreds of thousands of lives. But it's a deceptive anniversary, because since Ukraine's independence from Soviet Russia more than 30 years ago, animosity had been rising between the two neighbors. And there's been a low-level war going on since Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. The conflict has divided the world into two main camps. One of them is strongly anti-Russian, and the other is more ambivalent. For many leaders in the West, including U.S. President Joe Biden, the idea that borders and countries are sacred and no one should be allowed to erase them is worth fighting for. The rest of the world takes a more nuanced approach, citing hundreds of years of shared history between the two nations, Ukraine and Russia. But with total military victory for either side being highly unlikely and no negotiations on the table, is there any way out of this war? How many more anniversaries of misery is the world going to mark? And for Ukraine and the West, what does victory even look like? Today we're getting two views on the war in Ukraine, one from Moscow and one from Washington. In a moment, we'll be speaking with Andrei Kortunov, director of the Russian International Affairs Council. But we'll start with Admiral John Kirby, coordinator for strategic communications at the National Security Council in the White House, who's just returned from Poland, where he was with President Biden. Admiral Kirby, thank you so much for joining us today. My question to you, after the president's comments in, in Poland, is are Americans hearing what our stakes are in this conflict and crisis? I believe that they are. And of course, that was a main uh, purpose of the, the president going to Kyiv uh, this week, as well as to Poland and delivering a major address there in Warsaw to make plain to the world, certainly to the American people, but but to the whole world, uh, what's at stake here uh, with the war going on in Ukraine and particularly going forward. Now, there's been an incredible unity and support for Ukraine over the last year. Sadly, it's been a year. Uh, and now we're heading into our second year. Hopefully it won't last much longer, but we've got to stay resolved. We have to stay united. Uh, and the president wanted to make that case directly to people all around the world. Yeah. Uh, Admiral, uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Michael McCall is asking for the administration to do more, to give more lethal weapons, to give longer range missiles, to, to, to amp up essentially our military support in the side. There are other Republicans say do far, far less. In fact, do nothing. That yeah. what we invest... Uh, in Ukraine is a distraction from needs in America, adding to the debt, et cetera. I guess my question is, what's your directional course in dealing with Republicans on this conflict? I think I'd make a couple of points. First is, is that we have really had uh, continued bicameral and bipartisan support for the kind of things, the kinds of things that we are trying to do for Ukraine. And it's we all get wrapped up in the weapons and the systems, but it's 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 beyond that. It's also the humanitarian assistance, the financial assistance. Um, and when you talk to the the new House leadership, you'll hear pretty consistently from them, uh, like. Uh, Chairman McCall, you mentioned, and Speaker McCarthy, that they recognize the stakes here uh, and that they want to continue to support Ukraine. So we're not taking that for granted, of course, but the number of Republicans who are uh, in the opposite camp are small uh, and they are not in the, in, the, in the key leadership positions. We're going to continue to work with Congress uh, going forward. When we have enough resources to get us through much of this fiscal year uh, uh, through uh, 2023, uh, and if we need to go back to Congress for more, hopefully we won't. Hopefully this war will be over. But if we have to, uh, we'll do that, and we can do that with the confidence that, again, leadership on both sides of the aisle are very supportive of this. Number two, uh, and, and this is not unimportant, is we, we recognize that, the, that there, are even, there are American citizens who are like, likewise asking many of these questions uh, about continued support for Ukraine. Uh, and I would say that most Americans understand the idea of independence. It's a founding ideal here. Uh, it's something near and dear to all our heart our hearts. And it's important to remember that that's what Ukraine is fighting for, its very independence. Mr. Putin has not backed off his strategic goals of subsuming Ukraine into Russia. He still wants uh, Ukraine as another province. Uh, so it's fighting for the very idea of independence, something that all Americans can understand. And number two, if we waver, if we flag, if Mr. Putin succeeds, we don't know what he'll go after next. And the cost in blood and treasure to the United States, as well as to our allies and partners, could be exorbitantly much higher uh, than what it has been in terms of the resources we've applied to help Ukraine over the, the course of this year. Let me ask you a question that I'm not entirely comfortable with, but you know, we have a lot of um, folks that are defining this conflict as not just about Ukraine. It's about 
the future of the norms between nations. They're imbuing it with lots of sort of larger order questions. And I guess yeah. my question is, if so much is at stake, why do we fear so much escalating it if the stakes are that high? Because I think we can all understand, Steve, as bad as this war has been uh, for the people of Ukraine and for U Ukraine's cities and towns, their children, uh, that if it escalates and becomes what Mr. Putin has claimed it has been falsely since the beginning, a war between the United States and Russia or the West versus Russia or NATO versus Russia, if it escalates to that level, it's not only going to be much worse for the people of Ukraine than it already has been, it'll be much worse for the European continent, our allies and partners, and potentially the world. Uh, it is important that we do not seek a conflict with Russia, and we don't buy into Putin's propaganda that we're already at that level. Because again, I think we can all understand that the stakes of that kind of conflict uh, would be just exorbitantly worse for, uh, again, the people of Ukraine, uh, our allies and partners, and the American people. From your perspective, what are the requirements for an off-ramp or an endgame in this? I know you've basically said in the past that Vladimir Putin could end this tomorrow by pulling the military out and going home and end of story. But on a realistic basis, is there uh, uh, an end game or something that we might begin looking for as we move forward to this next year where there's something other than a another never-ending war? We all want this war to end. And as you've rightly said, we've said it could end today if P Putin would do the right thing. Clearly, Steve, he shows no signs of, of being willing to do that. And so President Zelensky has put forth a 10-point proposal, uh, and he has called for a just peace. We are working with his team to see how that proposal can be operationalized, um, and there's still a lot of work being done there. Uh, but for negotiations to occur, both sides have to be willing to do it, and both sides have to be willing to do it in good faith. President Zelensky uh, has rightly said at this time he can't see himself getting to the table, given what Mr. Putin continues to do inside his country. And for Mr. Putin's part, he obviously isn't interested in any kind of end right now or negotiated solution uh, as he continues to bomb Ukrainian cities, knock out the heat, uh, turn off the power, uh, try to brutalize the Ukrainian people, steal their young children and bring them off to camps inside Ru uh, Russia, and of course uh, continue to prepare for what looks to be more offensive operations in, in the spring. So unfortunately, sadly, the, the environment's just not conducive right now to a negotiated settlement. What we want to do, Steve, is, and you've heard the president say this, we want to help Ukraine's forces succeed on the battlefield to continue the success that they have uh, seen in the last year so that if and when President Zelensky is ready to sit down with President Putin, he can do so with the wind at his back. He can do so uh, with, with it from a position of strength, uh, because that's what he's going to need to carry those negotiations forward to some to some level of, of success. You know, I've talked to many of your colleagues, John, about who've had meticulous attention on China and what it's doing or not doing. And over this last year, I guess a good story is that the U.S. has assessed that China has not been a backstop uh, in key technologies and military provision uh, for Russia, but there is now concern that it might go over that line. Do right. you worry that China, that we have intelligence that is now seeing a shift in the Chinese-Russian, I guess, partnership or relationship in a way where we will soon be real adversaries to both of them tied together. Is that a concern of yours? It is. We want China to join the rest of the international community in condemning this invasion and not and holding Mr. Putin accountable and certainly not doing anything that allows his military uh, to be able to continue to prosecute this war uh, against the Ukrainian people. Uh, now, we have not seen them uh, devote lethal assistance uh, to the Russian military, but we have seen some worrying indications that they might be considering that sort of move. And I think we can all agree and all understand that that, that is not only not going to be good for uh, the, the Ukrainian people if Russia can gain more lethal assistance from China, uh, but it could actually make this, uh, it could escalate the conflict uh, beyond what it already is, and nobody wants to see that. Uh, so uh, we've, we've said uh, that we've seen these indications. We'll, we'll see and watch what China decides to do, uh, but it is uh, concerning to us that, uh, that that China continues to to appear to deepen this relationship with uh, with Russia at a time when Russia should be made even more of a pariah than it already is, when Mr. Putin should be held to account and when his and where his troops uh, should not be inside Ukraine uh, fighting again against the Ukrainian people. So we're worried. We're, we're certainly worried about uh, what we see on, on the diplomatic front between China and Russia right now. 
I know this is, a, is an odd question, but I, I guess my question is, are we doing enough? You've met President Zelensky now a number of times. You, you've been on the ground there. You've been with the president in Poland. What is missing that can help give Zelensky more tools than he has today well, President Zelensky has been uh, unabashed, as you know, Steve, in asking for additional resources and certainly having them uh, show up faster. And we are working as hard as we can in lockstep with him and his military to give him a, a more advanced capabilities so that um, so that he can, again, continue to succeed on the battlefield. And, and that support has evolved as the war has evolved. When the tanks were starting to roll towards Kyiv, everybody was talking about the need for stingers and javelin anti-tank missiles. And, and of course, we, we raced those to uh, the front so that uh, Ukraine could win the Battle of Kyiv. Then in the spring, when Mr. Putin decided he was going to concentrate on in the Donbass and in the south, and he pulled his troops out of Kyiv and Kharkiv and elsewhere, uh, it really became an issue of long-range fires, artillery, and these vaunted HIMARS, the advanced rocket systems that we provided to give the Ukrainian, Ukrainian military the ability to strike deep behind Russian lines inside Ukraine. Then air defense obviously rose to the fore as Mr. Putin shifted tactics yet again and started raining down cruise missiles on civilian infrastructure. And we're, we're now working to get them a Patriot battery. And, and there'd be more air defense capabilities uh, coming forward here uh, this week. You heard the president talk about that in, in Poland yesterday. Um, and, and now, of course, we're, we're, we're waiting. I shouldn't say waiting. That's not a good word. We are watching as Russia prepares uh, for what will likely be offensive operations in the spring. And so we are taking advantage of that time to train Ukrainian battalions outside the country on what we call combined arms maneuver. So this is open fight, uh, fighting in open terrain using armor, artillery, infantry, all integrated with air defense uh, to help Ukrainian uh, units make their own offensive operations possible uh, come spring. Uh, right. So we are not only evolving with the fight as it evolved, we're trying to get ahead of where we think things are going to be in the weeks and months ahead. Again, all designed to help the Ukrainian uh, army succeed on the, on the battlefield. Well, Admiral John Kirby, spokesman for the U.S. National Security Council, really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And now we turn to Moscow, where we're talking with Andrei Kortunov, Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council. From your perspective in Moscow, what is the topography of the geostrategic consequences of this war look like from your perspective a year into it? I think uh, that uh, if uh, I were to limit myself to just uh, one word describing the uh, preliminary results of the conflict, I would say uh, the uh, word would be resilience. Uh, all the sides of the conflict uh, demonstrated uh, some spectacular resilience and their ability to sustain the initial positions. It is true for Ukraine, which turned out uh, to be very robust and very committed uh, uh, to resisting the Russian actions. Uh, it can be applied to Russia because uh, the Russian economic system did not implode, it did not collapse, uh, the political opposition uh, did not take over, uh, Putin is still in control. Uh, it is uh, related to the West, uh, which also demonstrated uh, a lot of resilience uh, in maintaining its pressure on Russia. And finally, we can talk about the resilience of the rest. Uh, and the rest uh, has clearly demonstrated its uh, unwillingness to take sides in this conflict and uh, uh, to consider this conflict to be a global rather than a Euro-Atlantic problem. Well, what, what you've just described are conditions that can simmer for a lot longer. You, you, you've kind of talked about all the different parties, uh, no one necessarily getting a knockout blow and this continuing. I'm sure you heard as I did many speeches at the Munich, Munich Security Conference, saying that what's at stake in this conflict is essentially, you know, the, the norms of the liberal order in the world, you know, the, the, the fate of democracy, you know, in, endowing this conflict with lots of other issues. From Russia's perspective, and I'm not expecting you to be Russia, but from Russians' perspective, what are the stakes involved um, that we ought to be listening to? Well, the official Russian narrative, uh, and I think it was emphasized by President Putin today, uh, is that uh, it is uh, an existential challenge to Russia. Uh, Russia uh, has a conflict not with Ukraine, uh, but uh, with the quote-unquote collective West. Uh, and this collective West uh, allegedly is uh, committed uh, to destroying Russia, uh, to erasing Russia from the map of the world. 
That's why it is so difficult uh, to look for a compromise. It is so difficult to withdraw uh, because the conflict is perceived uh, as uh, existential, as something uh, which uh, is uh, uh, directly connected to the future of Russia as an independent country, as a society, if you wish, as a civilization. Are we basically in you know, the draft of history seeing the influence of both Russia and the United States go through serious transformation. And we may be as unaware of it as Moscow may be as unaware of it. I'm sure that uh, we will see a very deep transformation uh, in Russia and uh, in the United States. Uh, just to you know, look at uh, who now runs our two countries, uh, we have uh, people in their 70s. Uh, these generations will not stay in power forever, and uh, there will be some uh, very significant uh, generational change. Uh, I think that uh, maybe in a couple of years down the road, uh, we'll have uh, new people in power who have uh, different perceptions uh, of the world, uh, of their country's role in the world. Uh, besides, uh, we should also keep in mind that uh, uh, other countries are getting stronger, other countries are getting more active. Other countries uh, want uh, to become active players uh, in the international system, and there is no way uh, Russia or the United States or anyone else can stop it. So the world will be very different in a couple of years from what we see now. And uh, maybe the only sin uh, silver lining uh, in this uh, very dark, uh, 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 cloudy uh, atmosphere that we have today uh, is that uh, this crisis might become a catalyst uh, for changes uh, which uh, are overdue, changes uh, which are badly needed, but which uh, have been delayed uh, for quite a time. I think that uh, we procrastinated for too long, and maybe now it's time to speed up. Is Beijing thrilled with this moment? Are they seeing, you know, their fortunes rise as we have this proxy conflict uh, with Ukraine, in Ukraine? Huh. It's hard to tell, but I think that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, they believe that uh, uh, time is playing on their side. Mm. Uh, with, with time, uh, China will get stronger. Uh, it will get a more prominent place uh, in the international system. Uh, they do not want uh, to uh, yield uh, to the United States on what is really important for them. But at the same time, uh, they do not want to provoke the United States uh, uh, too actively. So I think that uh, uh, the Chinese position will be, uh, let's wait and see how this uh, conflict evolves. Uh, and then uh, we can uh, probably uh, try to participate uh, in working on a peace settlement. But what do you think would be on the laundry list of items that Russian leaders would need to see to begin taking a different track? A lot will depend uh, on uh, uh, what kind of Ukraine we will see in future. I think that would uh, define uh, the territorial ambitions of the Russian Federation. It's one thing if Ukraine stays neutral, uh, if uh, you know Russia gets some security guarantees. It's yet uh, it's very different uh, picture if uh, Ukraine uh, uh, is uh, deeply engaged uh, with the NATO alliance, uh, is heavily militarized. Uh, uh, is uh, explicitly anti-Russian. And then I think uh, Russia would probably uh, insist on a buffer zone or something like that. But it's hard to tell. I think a lot will depend on the situation in the battlefield. You know, one of the questions I have is the tension between a global war and people in Oklahoma saying, hey, our schools are crumbling. Why are we spending tax dollars on this conflict so far away and not understanding um, that global stability matters to them at home. And this is classically, we've seen through human history, at least in the modern era, what drives and fuels populist movements. We've seen um, this frustration between the domestic and the international really come into conflict. And I'm, I'm interested in whether that's part of the calculation here, that, that the West, from your perspective, and you know us very well, whether our resolve is shaky and wobbly in this conflict because there are other choices that societies want to make? Uh, it might be uh, one of the considerations uh, uh, in Moscow. 
Uh, indeed, uh, we all know that uh, in the West, uh, the attention span uh, of uh, the general public uh, uh, is limited. And uh, who knows what happens in the United States uh, uh, after elections of uh, 2024? Uh, who knows what happens uh, in Europe? So there might be some expectations that uh, the Western cohesion uh, is not strategic but tactical, that mm. uh, it will be replaced uh, by some rifts uh, within particular states like the United States or between states like uh, between uh, the two sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so uh, there might be uh, some expectations uh, that uh, uh, Russia uh, can uh, simply wait uh, and uh, observe uh, the Western unity uh, gradually eroded. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that uh, Russia's resources are, are not limited, limitless either. Uh, Russia might be resilient, uh, but uh, definitely uh, it cannot uh, sustain a war if uh, this war lasts forever. So I would say that uh, there are significant risks on both sides. Uh, regarding the ability to sustain this conflict for an extended period of time. And uh, right now, we do not know uh, what side has uh, more resilience uh, and more resolve and how this resolve will be sustained. I'd just be interested, as someone who studied the United States so much, what blind spots, if any, do you see in America's leadership and calculus right now? The balance of power in the world uh, has changed so dramatically uh, since the beginning of this century, uh, it is literally impossible uh, to restore the uniform world uh, strategically. Mm. Uh, so I can only hope uh, that uh, the United States uh, will uh, 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 will be more aware of the limitations, not only of the opportunities which it has right now, but also of the strategic limitations uh, uh, which exist in the world. It doesn't mean that uh, the United States will necessarily get weaker, but it means that other countries uh, will get stronger. And uh, they would uh, try to get their fair share of the decision-making power in the world. So uh, I hope uh, that uh, the United States uh, will do its best in uh, practicing uh, true multilateralism, uh, working both with its partners and uh, with its opponents. And I also believe that uh, the United States uh, might reconsider, you know, this, uh, uh, in my view, rather simplified uh, approach uh, to the world, uh, dividing the world uh, into good democracies and bad autocracies. Uh, the world is not so black and white. Uh, there are many <laughs> shades and many colors in the world which uh, have to be taken into account. Well, with that, we will finish great discussion. I always learn from you. Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, Andrei Kwartunov, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So what's the bottom line? Whether both sides finally decide to sit down at the negotiating table and make tough compromises or not, here are the two things to keep your eyes on this year. One, more and more folks in the Western world will wonder why their schools are crumbling and life is becoming more expensive as their tax money funds this war. Their worries may lead to more populism and test the resolve of the West to keep up its financial support, which is crucial for keeping Ukraine afloat. And two, more and more folks in the rest of the world may wonder why this faraway war even matters to them. Many nations like India and China and others haven't drawn lines of right and wrong in this conflict and may resist American pressure to isolate and punish Russia. As the world divides between two big camps on Ukraine, the risk to global stability and international economic growth could be staggering. There's just no sugarcoating it. This is going to be a tough slog. And that's the bottom line. Yeah.